Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I'm Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about birds, nature, and vent tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on Grand Alaska by Barry Zimmer. During this session, all attendees may download handouts and ask questions. Please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. However, if you have any technical issues during our session, I'll try my best to answer them in real time and help you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email in the next few days. Now back to our feature presentation. Barry Zimmer began birding at the age of eight and has been a full-time vent leader since 1986. His main areas of expertise lie in North and Central America, but his travels have taken him throughout much of the world, including such exotic locales as Japan, South Africa, Madagascar, Antarctica, Australia, and New Zealand. He has also led cruises to the Galapagos and in the North Pacific. As a leader of our Alaska and Kamchatka cruise, he spotted a yellow-browed warbler, a species that has been recorded in North America only once. Barry is a longtime member of the New Mexico Bird Records Committee and served on the Texas Bird Records Committee for 12 years. He has co-authored three books, Birds of the Trans-Pecos, A Birder's Guide to the Rio Grande Valley, and Birds and Bird Finding in the El Paso area. He has a keen interest in nature photography, having captured over 1,600 species of birds. His other interests include sports, he's a diehard Red Sox fan, cooking, and movies. He received his degree in psychology at the University of Texas in El Paso. Barry resides in El Paso with his wife, Yvonne, and their daughter, Alexandra. We are thrilled to have Barry present about Vint's Grand Alaska program. We hope you enjoy this webinar. Without further ado, we will turn to Barry's presentation. I wanna welcome everybody to our Grand Alaska webinar and thank you for joining us. Uh, VENT has a very extensive Alaska program, and over the next hour or so, I'd like to uh, break down that program and show you some of the highlights of each area. One of the most common questions I get asked on tours is, what is your favorite tour to lead? And that is a really difficult question to answer because all the tours are great, and it's kind of comparing apples and oranges often. But I can say, uh, pretty much hands down that my favorite North American tour that I lead every year is Alaska. Look forward to that tour the most of any. And there are multiple reasons uh, why I think Alaska is so appealing. First of all, they're, from a birding standpoint, there are a lot of species of birds that can only be found in Alaska. If you're going to add them to your North American list, you have to go to Alaska. There are birds that uh, just trickle over from Asia Things like blue throat and Arctic warbler and bristle thigh curlew, bar tail godwit, spectacled and stellar's eiders, wagtails, Aleutian terns, things that you simply have to go to Alaska to see. So that's the, the, the first appeal. And the second one is there's another group of birds uh, that are more widespread. They're not just found in Alaska, they're found across the northern tier of North America. But most of northern Canada is basically inaccessible. And so this other group of birds of things like jeer falcon and willow ptarmigan and hawk owl and northern shrike and bohemian waxwing. Basically, unless you live in the far northern lower 48, you may get an incursion of those birds in winter. Uh, you, you pretty much, Alaska is the best place to see those species as well. So there's a whole cluster of birds that are pretty much unique to Alaska. And then there are other birds that while you see them regularly in the lower 48, most people tend to see them when they're not in breeding plumage. So this would include things like shorebirds, long spurs, loons, eiders, seabirds. A lot of those things, you may, you may see them. You may go on a pelagic trip and see some of those birds. You may see 
see them as they're moving north or southward in migration, but they're often not in breeding plumage. They're either transitioning or they're in winter plumage. And so the difference be between seeing a long spur, for instance, on its wintering grounds, many people may see lots of long spur somewhere, and seeing it on the breeding grounds is like seeing a different bird. So the birding in Alaska is amazing. And if that weren't enough, you have mammals, just incredible mammal watching. Uh, our, depending on which Alaska tour you choose, many of our trips uh, have mammal lists that exceed 20 species. And we're not talking about a lot of squirrels and chipmunks and bats and small mammals. We're talking large, spectacular mammals, bears and caribou and muskox and moose and whales. So the mammal watching is, is amazing. And then to top it all off, I think as you can see in this introductory slide, Alaska has unparalleled scenery. Uh, I've traveled around the world and can't say I've been anywhere where the scenery is as spectacular and as nonstop as it is in Alaska. So a lot of reasons to visit. And uh, as I mentioned, Ben has an extensive program in Alaska. And so we'll take a look at the different tours that we do run there. This webinar is going to focus mostly on the last three that you see on your screen. We start out, uh, all these trips can be taken. You could start with the Pribloffs and end with the very bottom there, Kenai Peninsula, Grand Alaska II. You could do the whole program, be gone about five weeks or so. Uh, if you had that sort of time, that would, that would be the obvious, uh, fantastic thing to be able to do and see all of Alaska. I don't personally lead the Pribloffs trip or the uh, Gamble tours. Those tours are led by my brother, Kevin Zimmer and Brian Gibbons. But I do wanna to touch on them briefly. The, uh, the pr first tour of the Pribloffs and Anchorage pre-trip. The Pribloffs are uh, islands located out in the Bering Sea, famous for their spectacular seabird colonies. You can walk up to the tops of cliffs and look down at seabirds, uh, tufted and horned puffins, red-faced cormorant, red-legged kittiwakes, auklets, murres, and have them be really quite close and great photographic opportunities, really once in a lifetime experience to be in the Pribilofs and see the seabird colonies. And additionally, it's a great place for Asiatic vagrants, birds that stray from Siberia, get lost out over the ocean and, and land in the Pribilofs. And then that tour concludes with a couple of days of birding uh, in and around Anchorage as well to see some of the birds there. The second uh, tour you see, Nome and Gamble. You might notice Nome is listed on three different trips. Uh, within Alaska, Nome is easily my favorite part. It is the most exciting area to bird for me, a true wilderness area. So it's included in three different tours. And here we have Nome and Gamble combined together. Uh, Gamble is probably most famous for being, uh, again, a spot for Asiatic strays. Many first North American records have occurred there. A lot of uh, odd Siberian birds that uh, pop down and gamble, but it's also well known for its seabird colonies, much like the Pribloffs. You're not as close, but there's actually more seabirds. I believe the cliffs near Gamble host over 1.5 million seabirds uh, of 13 different species. So you have tremendous flights of auks particularly um, uh, crested auklet and least auklets uh, are the most common ones, but huge flights of those, and you have eiders there and lots of other birds. So this, that tour combines gnome and gamble. Then you get into the third item there, which is gnome and barrow, and I believe that is what we call Grand Alaska One, that combination. And we'll really delve heavily into gnome here to start out the webinar. Uh, the second part, Barrow, is uh, probably primarily known as the place to go see eiders, all four species of eiders, and snowy owl. Then you see a standalone gnome pre-trip. Uh, that can be paired up with the bottom tour, which is Grand Alaska II, Anchorage, Denali, and the Kenai Peninsula. So you could do gnome and Barrow. Grand Alaska One and pair it with Anchorage, Denali, Kenai Peninsula. But if you had less time and you just wanted to pair Nome with the bottom trip, you could do that as well. So there's a standalone 
five day Nome pre trip. And then you conclude with the final tour, Anchorage, Tenali, Kenai Peninsula. So these last three we're going to uh, delve into pretty heavily here. We have some tour route maps that you can see uh, for the first tour here, starting in Anchorage, uh, flying out to St. Paul Island in the Pribloffs, spending several days there, returning to Anchorage, and having a couple days birding in Anchorage. Then the second tour was Nome and Gamble. So you would fly from Anchorage uh, out to Nome, bird Nome for three full days, then continue on to St. Lawrence Island, Gamble. You can notice its proximity to Russia here, a very short distance from Gamble. I think this is like 40 or 50 miles from Gamble over to uh, Siberia, which is why there are so many Asiatic strays that occur there, and then flying back to Anchorage. Then the last map here shows our Grand Alaska 1 and Grand Alaska 2. So Grand Alaska 1 is uh, flying from Anchorage to Nome, back to Anchorage, up to Barrow, and back to Anchorage. Combines Nome and Barrow. And then Grand Alaska 2 starts with an optional free trip just to Nome and back. And the remainder of Grand Alaska 2 is a ground-based tour, so no flights on that trip. Uh, starts in Anchorage and drive, birds around Anchorage, drives up to Denali National Park to the north, returns back to Anchorage, and then goes south to the Kenai Peninsula and Seward, and then returning to Anchorage. So let's start out with Nome. I said Nome was my very favorite part of Alaska, and it's hard to pick out uh, amongst all the great Alaska destinations, but Nome just really combines, I think, the best of all of Alaska. It's located on the Bering Sea on the west coast of Alaska, on the Seward Peninsula. It's about 150 miles south of the Arctic Circle, not quite in the zone of 24-hour daylight, but uh, at the time we're there in June, the sunrise is typically around 4.30 in the morning and doesn't set until 1.30 the next morning. And in between those times, it's light enough to bird all day. If you wanted to bird 24 hours a day in Nome, you could certainly do that. Nome has a population now of just under 4,000 people. Uh, it's a small little town, has three roads that radiate out from the town center, and they all dead end about 75, 80 miles out. Each road has a different set of birds, a different habitat. You have to fly to get to Nome, fly or take a ship. There's no, no way to drive to Nome. This uh, first slide does show the premier bird of any visit to Nome, the blue throat. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So the habitat around Nome is largely uh, wet tundra, kind of moist rolling uh, foothill tundra with intermittent rivers and lagoons and lakes. This is a place called Salmon Lake out on the Kugarak Road. And there are tons of birds right in, in town in Nome. You don't have to go far to see them. Nome became famous uh, in 1898 when the gold rush happened. Gold was discovered in Nome and people flocked up there uh, in the early 1900s. And at the peak time, it's estimated that the population of Nome was over 20,000 people, which is pretty incredible, given that it's only 3,000 now. But you still see uh, remnants of the, the gold rush, like this old gold dredge right around town. They just left the machinery there, and so uh, you, sites like this are quite common. But the birds right around Nome, you don't even have to leave the town to see a lot of birds. Uh, a lot of spectacular birds, Lapland longspur, often called the house sparrow of Nome. Uh, you can see it right in town, sitting on people's rooftops. And this is one of those things we talked about where uh, you may have seen Lapland longspur if you live in the northern tier of states in the wintertime when they're very drab and brown, nondescript looking. But this is what they look like in the breeding season. Just incredible, incredibly beautiful birds with wonderful skylarking songs. Red-throated loons are very common. If you're just even walking the streets of Nome, you'll see them flying overhead almost constantly. 
uh, upon less than a half mile from our hotel. It's where this photo was taken. Uh, they breed right there. They are just numerous all around around Nome. And I'll mention again later, but Nome is the best place in the country where you have a chance to see all five species of loons on the same trip. If you're incredibly fortunate, you may see them in the same day. Arctic terns are uh, common pretty much everywhere in Alaska from north to south, certainly common right around uh, Nome itself. This one's sitting on a nest right on the edge of the road just outside of Nome. Pacific golden plovers, shorebirds are abundant in Nome, uh, breeding all over the tundra. I think the last two years we've done uh, trips to Nome, we haven't even made it from the airport to our hotel without seeing a Pacific golden plover en route. And we're gonna talk more about this and American gold plover shortly, uh, the differences and how they were split. But this is a breeding Pacific, breeding plumage Pacific golden plover. One of my favorite things of being in Nome and, and uh, being in this true wilderness experience are seeing the muskox. And muskox are uh, common in Nome now. This one, not even a mile outside of the town limits, just sitting up on a knoll, a beautiful bull muskox. And they've increased dramatically uh, over the last couple decades there. Uh, muskox occurred historically in Nome in Alaska until about the 1920s and they were hunted out. And they began reintroducing them a couple decades later, specifically in the Seward Peninsula, they started reintroduction. They brought in muskox from Greenland and, and brought in 30 muskox and reintroduced them in the early 70s. And that population has now expanded to 3,400. They're a common sight on all of our tours in the Nome area. And you can, it's hard, hard to tell, but this is actually in someone's front yard. Uh, you can see over here on the far left, a sprinkler system where they're watering their grass, the guy wire coming down from the utility pole. This is a, a female muskox with two babies and there's not much cuter in the world than a baby muskox. Long-tailed Jaegers, common all over uh, the Nome area, the most common Jaeger. Most parts of the country, if you go on a pelagic trip somewhere and hope to see some Jaegers, long-tailed is typically the rarest Jaeger. But in Nome, it's the common one. The spectacular long forked tail here sticking out, and you don't have to get very far out of the, out of the town of Nome to see long-tailed Jaegers. You may even see them flying right over the streets of Nome. So I mentioned that, that there are three roads that radiate out from Nome, and they each cover a little bit different habitats. The first one we're gonna cover is the Teller Road, which goes northwesterly from Nome. Starts out in some low wet tundra, but eventually gets into some high dry uh, rocky tundra domes. So as you leave town, you may quickly encounter ptarmigan, willow ptarmigan, the state bird of Alaska. Uh, this a male on top here and a female down in the lower center. Uh, the male is transitioning from winter plumage where it's all white except for its tail to breeding plumage where it becomes largely brown. But at this time of year, it's kind of in between and has a deep red head with just a few brown feathers coming in on the back. Ptarmigan numbers fluctuate uh, cyclically in Alaska. They go through these periods where they are increasing, 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 and they become abundant and then they crash, and then they're very scarce, and then they slowly build up. And uh, we have tours where we may see 30, 40 willow ptarmigan in a day, and we've had tours where we only see one for the whole trip. Never have missed the species completely, but their abundance uh, really goes through distinct cycles. Anywhere where you're outside of Nome, you may encounter moose, and for that matter, almost anywhere in Alaska, you may encounter moose. And this one, a uh, cow moose with a newborn calf out on the Teller Road on a recent tour. This is the time to see baby moose. Almost every calf you see has one or two little uh, calves in tow. Bartail godwit, one of the species that we've talked about uh, that comes across 
just barely getting into North America in Western Alaska. And Nome is an ideal place to see it. This is a female, so it's rather pale below. The males are richer orangish below. But bartail godwits are exceptional. They make what I would say is the most incredible migration of any bird in the world. It's the world's longest nonstop flight. And they've been studying bartail godwits uh, using satellite telemetry recently. They winter way down south here. If you look at this map in New Zealand, a lot of great mudflat areas for wintering shorebirds in New Zealand. And one particular bird was banded at a spot here in New Zealand several years ago, maybe six, five or six years ago. And in the spring, this is the Bowerai subspecies of bartail godwit that occurs in Alaska. And in the spring, they, they fly up on a route along this yellow line up towards the Asian coast. They make stops in between, particularly in this area around the Yellow Sea, uh, fatten up and then continue the migration on along the Aleutians here and up into Alaska. And you can see the red areas are where bartail godwits breed, where the cursor is now is the Seward Peninsula, uh, where Nome is located. They breed and then in the fall, they migrate south. But when they, when they do head south, they take a different route. They learn through this, this tracking device that they head directly south along this green line all the way to New Zealand nonstop. And the bird that they had, uh, that they were tracking, took eight days to cover this distance. Before it took off, it fed voraciously, built up its body fat reserves, and then just launched out over the ocean. And this particular stretch from Nome all the way down to New Zealand covers 7,257 miles of nonstop flight. Bird average over 35 miles an hour, 24 hours a day for over eight days to reach New Zealand. And when it arrived, incredibly, it always boggles my mind, it landed, set down eight miles from the spot where it had been banded six months earlier in the spring. Incredibly precise, the migration, the ability to, to almost return to the exact spot that it had wintered the previous season. This would be the equivalent of a human being, to put it in perspective, running 43 and a half miles an hour, 24 hours a day for a week, nonstop. Obviously, human couldn't run 43 and a half miles an hour for one hour without dying. Imagine a bird doing that for eight days in the case of this one bird. So incredible migration of the bartail godwit. Wildflowers are also a big part of Alaska and particularly the tours that visit Nome later into June. They have some amazing wildflower displays. Uh, the later in June, the better. This is one of my favorites, the state flower of Alaska, the Alpine forget-me-not. Moss campion is another flower that you commonly encounter in these uh, cushions full of, of, of flowers that just light up the tundra. As you go further out the Tella Road, you get on these high rocky domes I, I mentioned that are drier. It's not the moist tundra, it's a rocky drier tundra. And here is an American golden plover. We saw a Pacific golden plover earlier. And you can see in the background here all these the flowers. The tundra is just carpeted with wildflowers. The Nome area was where the studies were done that resulted in the split of American golden plover and Pacific golden plover. They found that what had thought they had thought was one species previously were breeding in different areas. The Pacific golden plover on the right breeding down in the low coastal wet tundra and the American golden plover on the left breeding in high dry rocky tundra areas. Obviously visual differences as well. The Pacific golden plover, as you see this white border between the golden upper parts and the black underparts is continuous all the way down. White all the way down along the wing, all the way back to the undertail coverts, which are kind of speckled black and white. And it doesn't really, it stays a fairly continuous width. If you look at the American golden plover on the left, the white comes down 
gets much thicker on the mid breast, upper breast, bulges out and then stops. And then it's black all the way down along the wing. A couple other minor differences. The American Golden Plover has much longer wing tips. You can see they stick out well past the tail. And on the Pacific Golden Plover, they are shorter. Pacific Golden Plover is a little bit longer in the legs. American Golden Plover a little shorter. But it was right here in Nome where we see both these species that the work was done and this, uh, resulted in the split in 1993, making them two species instead of one. More muskox on the, uh, they love those high rocky domes browsing here. These guys are survivors from the Pleistocene age, really prehistoric looking, just possibly my favorite mammal anywhere. They're just amazing to see. Other birds you might encounter on these high rocky domes are uh, birds like northern wheat ear. This is a male carrying, you can see he's got food in his mouth, had a nest right under the left side of this little rocky shelf. Rock sandpiper, a uh, bird that is common out on the Pribloff Islands where uh, one of our early tours goes. In Nome, it's really quite scarce, but if you're going to see one, you would see it on these rocky domes. Rock ptarmigan. The uh, willow ptarmigan we saw earlier prefer the uh, wet coastal uh, tundra, but the rock ptarmigan like the high dry stuff. So this is where you might encounter a rock ptarmigan, and this is a male, and you can see that his head is not nearly as red as what the uh, willow ptarmigan that we saw earlier was. It's more of a, a colder gray brown, and the body is overall whiter. Uh, rock ptarmigans molt later in the season than willows do, and so they tend to be white in the middle of June, much whiter than the willow ptarmigans are. Females are another matter entirely. They are perfectly camouflaged against the tundra background. Beautiful uh, combination of gold and buff and black, and you can be staring right at one and not be able to pick it out from the grass. The other second road that we're gonna cover is the Council Road, which goes out from Nome easterly, right along the coastline, goes through the Safety Lagoon Complex about 15 miles out, and eventually about 20 to 25 miles out, bends inland. This primarily you go out Council Road to see water birds. And one of the special birds there is the Aleutian Terns, which breed just a few miles outside of town along the Nome River mouth. This turn can be identified by its white forehead, all black bill instead of red bill, and really dusky underparts. You might see beautiful harlequin ducks resting along the coastline here, or common eiders sitting along the beach. This is a distinct subspecies of common eider, not the one you find in the northeastern United States. This is uh, one called V. nigra, and it's distinguishable by its bright orange bill on the male. It has two thin black lines under the chin that you cannot see on this slide. These are females here and here, and this third bird in the middle right is a female king eider, which is a rare migrant in Nome. You could encounter any of the scoters in Nome. Black scoter is the common breeding bird around Nome. And in Nome, you're always looking for rarities. Some rarities are uh, regular, such as this slaty-backed gull. It's not an, not an adult, a second or third year bird, but you can see the dark mantle here. This is one that we see on most tours. Uh, redneck stint is another that we often see in Nome, but you also see some true uh, super vagrants, things like Hooper Swan and Great Knot and things like that are occasion occasionally encountered. You never know when you're in Nome uh, when you go around the next corner, what you might run into. One of the other special birds of Western Alaska is Eastern Yellow Wagtail, a bird that's often found around the edges of lagoons and driftwood. And you might see short-eared owls. This one is a species that is very uh, dependent upon rodent populations. In years when there are a lot of voles in the Nome area, there are a lot of short-eared owls. In years when there aren't many voles, there are very few, but we almost always encounter at least one or two short-eared owls on our trip. 
I mentioned that Nome was a great place to see loons, and you have the potential to see all five loons. The rarest one is the Arctic loon. And most years, there are one to two pairs of Arctic loons that breed somewhere in the safety lagoon complex. They can be devilishly hard to find. Arctic loons are very similar to Pacific loons uh, in plumage. One of the main differences is this area on the front bird, you can see where the body meets the water, a white flank patch. So white is visible above the water line. On Pacific loon, this area would all be dark. Their head shape is also different, more blocky, distinct bump here in the front and a bump in the back, not as rounded. The head coloration is a darker gray than on Pacific loon. And they tend to hold their bill uh, pointed upward, more like a red throat loon. It's better seen on this back bird. Pacific loon tends to hold its bill horizontal, but uh, Arctic loon has a more uh, upward tilted bill point. When you're driving along the shore, you might see spotted seals hauled out on the beach. This was a youngster, just a little pup that was hauled out as we were looking at some shorebirds and he didn't seem to mind our presence. A couple other loons, neither one of which that breeds in the Nome area, but could be seen as migrants. We were, uh, this was about three or four years ago, we were just loading up the vans in our hotel parking lot when one member of the group, and I'll give a shout out to Michael Gray in case he's watching, came up to me and said, there's a yellow-billed loon across the street. And sure enough, uh, right across from our hotel, not more than 100 yards offshore, was this left-hand bird, yellow-billed loon, a rare bird in Nome, but one that we sometimes see. And in a perfect textbook comparison, there was a common loon just to the right of it. And that's an, another fairly rare bird in Nome, common in Southern Alaska, but have yellow-billed and common loon side by side from our hotel parking lot. It was an amazing way to start out our morning. A lot of shorebirds along Safety Lagoon. Uh, this is one of the more uncommon ones, a surf bird. They nest on the high domes, but come down to the lagoon to feed. This picture, uh, interestingly enough, was taken at about 1240 in the morning. You can see the sunlight still bathing the bird. Beautiful light for photography at 1240 in the morning. As the road bends inland away from the coast, uh, if you get lucky, you might encounter white wagtail bird that used to be more common and known, but has declined in recent decades, but they're often found along the gravelly riverbanks or by the old gold dredges. And the end of the council road, uh, or the middle portions of the council road, offer some great nesting cliffs for raptors. We've had one site uh, where we've had peregrine falcon regularly over the recent years. And this was one of the amazing Amazing sights of uh, any Alaska tour in recent memory. For two years in a row, a pair of golden eagles nested along the council road, right on the side of the road. Literally, you pulled the, your van up and you stopped and you did not get out. You looked out the windows and 30 feet away was a golden eagle sitting on a nest. Nowhere that I have traveled have I ever encountered a golden eagle that you could look this closely at. It was just astonishing. And she really didn't seem to mind. It was just a, a breathtaking view of a really magnificent raptor. Returning back into Nome, we stopped at that same pond uh, where we saw some red-throated loons earlier and the bird sitting on the nest. And this, this spot is literally about a mile from, less than a mile from our hotel. And this is one of those birds, again, full breeding plumage. Maybe you've seen red-throated loons migrating off the coast. They don't look anything like this. I included this shot. Uh, this was a late evening optional run for those who just couldn't get enough of birding. Uh, after dinner, we went out again with a small group, and this is looking at Safety Lagoon, and this picture taken about 12.30 in the morning. Still see plenty of birds out on the mud flats and plenty of light to go birding. The final road as we wrap up Nome here is the Kugarak Road, which goes inland northerly from town, uh, and there's a couple of real special birds. Not much in the way of water birds out the Kugarak Road. It's, it's mostly land birds. And one of the birds you look for is Arctic warbler. These little guys are the last arriving migrants into Alaska. Um, they winter in Southeast Asia, 
come up through Siberia, and then and then a percentage of them cross over uh, the Bering Sea and put down in western Alaska. Once they get in, they're very common. But if you're in Nome too early, you won't see them at all. Once they arrive, about the 10th of June or so, they are one of the most common birds uh, anywhere outside of Nome. We have a couple of known deer falcon nesting locations, both on this road and on the council road. And this is one that we were uh, looking at in 2019, I believe, adult deer falcon, gray morph here on the right with two or three, I can't remember, half grown chicks on the nest. And we were able to leisurely watch this um, nest from a good distance with a scope, but it was amazing views. And anytime you're out on the Kugarak Road, keep your eyes on the slopes because Nome is a good area to see grizzly bears. You see them on probably half of our tours there. The inland uh, grizz grizzly bear is the same species as brown bears that you find in south coastal Alaska, but the inland bears are smaller and they're blonder. So you can see on this uh, individual how pale it is on the back. Uh, I think that the grizzlies uh, only average and get up to a peak of about six to 700 pounds, the inland ones, whereas the coastal ones could easily be twice that. And the star, inevitably, if we do an Alaska tour and at the end we vote on our favorite birds of the tour, if we have seen blue throat well, it is almost always the group choice for favorite bird of the tour. This bird was uh, not previously known from the Nome area until 1987, when one of our tours led by my brother, Kevin, was birding out there and found a blue throat. And they were stunned and excited all at the same time. They tracked down a second vent group that was in the area at the same time, and, and the other group got to see it. This bird has become a staple of not only our tours, but everyone's tours that go out to Nome now. They were probably there all along, but just um, no one knew that they were there. And certainly they're not a rare bird in Nome. They are seen uh, on all of our Nome trips. The later you get into June, the harder they are to see. They become uh, quieter and less conspicuous, but they have a wonderful skylarking display where they go up into the sky and sing and float down to a landing spot. Just a truly amazing bird. And out at the far end of the Kugarak Road, you get to an area that's called Coffee Dome. This is some scenery near Coffee Dome, just looking back at the nonstop scenery that's 360 degrees all around you. And you, you stop in this area and you make a rigorous one mile each direction hike up to the top of a dome to look for the bristle-thigh curlew. Nome is the only accessible area in North America, not counting Hawaii, where you can find bristle thigh curlew. Uh, it's a bird that has, I think, a world population of only about, I think it's 4,000 birds or something like that. And there are other parts of Alaska in which they breed, but they're not areas that you can get to, really. It's researchers and scientists, but not your average person could never get there. Uh, now, of course, with as Hawaii has been added to the ABA list. Hawaii is a place where some bristle thigh curlews winter. And if you visit Hawaii on the big island on the North shore, take one of our tours there, you can see them on a golf course. So the, they have become easier to see with the addition of Hawaii. But if you're going to Alaska, you have to go to Nome, make this difficult hike up the tundra. And you can see part of our group here in the background watching. This uh, second person from the left is Eric Brunke, my co-leader, part of the group looking at the bristle thigh curlew. The curlews, when you find them, tend to walk away from you on the tundra, and they are much better at walking on the tundra than what people are, so they can get away quickly. So I had circled around this particular bird to prevent it from walking away from us and kind of had him penned in between me and the group, and it just sat there and allowed amazing views. Bristle thigh curlew is sim similar to Wimbrel, which is also a species you find in Nome. The tail here is a little bit hard to see under the wings, but has a, a pale tannish cinnamon color to it with black bars. The name bristle thigh curlew comes from some feathers on the thighs that are kind of uh, 
bristly looking, hard to see in this photo. Overall, its upper parts are more spangled golden than a wimbrel, and they have a different call. We don't see them on every trip. We have a better than 50% success rate that it's kind of the, the uh, holy grail bird of, of uh, the Kugarak Road and with blue throat, one of the two primary targets of any trip to Nome. Well, that took a long time, but we finished up Nome and we're moving on to Barrow. As I mentioned, Barrow, a uh, primary destination for seeing eiders and snowy owl in Alaska. So about four years ago, the residents of Barrow, which is uh, primarily a new uh, native people, voted to change the name from Barrow back to its original Anupiat name, which is Utkiagvik. And that name apparently means a place for gathering wild roots. You can see the town of Barrow here has about 4,200 people, a little bit bigger than Nome. It is above the Arctic Circle by about 320 miles. So at, this, at the time of year we visit in June, 24 hours of sunlight. I don't know exactly when this photo was taken, but I do know that it was taken uh, somewhere 11, midnight, 1 a.m., somewhere in that range. Again, a place you could bird all day. And this was taken from our hotel. You can see we're kind of on the outskirts of town with a big lagoon uh, between us and town. So the 24 hours of sunlight is great when you're there in June. I wouldn't really recommending recommend visiting Barrow in uh, November. The sun sets around November 18th and goes 65 days before it, it rises again. So that might be kind of a bleak time to visit. But we're there in June, and June also coincides with the Nalakatuk, which is the spring whaling festival. And Nalakatuk is a Inupiat word, which uh, actually means to toss up or to throw underhanded. And one of the big events of the Nalakatuk Whaling Festival is the blanket toss. You can't really see the blanket in the bottom of this photo. It's down here in the bottom right. It is made of a, uh, the skin of a bearded seal. And uh, the people who get up on the blanket, there's many people around the edge and they spring them up into the air and they start out with children and they go to adults and this is a this is an adult woman being thrown up sometimes they're like 15 20 feet up in the air above the above the blank it's really impressive to see and and again i'm taking this photo from our hotel parking lot so the festival happens right next to where we stay um, the festival is designed to celebrate the successful whaling hunts of the season particularly to celebrate the captain and the crews that successfully got a whale. And you're looking out and you can see the, the ice pack out behind here, uh, just in the ocean, just over the back of that dirt ridge. One of the roads that leads out of Barrow, uh, it goes to Point Barrow, which is the northernmost um, point in North America. And I should have mentioned that Barrow is the northernmost community in North America and one of the northernmost communities in the world. I believe the ninth northernmost community in the world. But Point Barrow is about uh, maybe eight miles out of town. And as you drive along a, a road that's bordered by the Chukchi Sea on one side and the Beaufort Sea on the other, most years you're seeing a lot of pack ice, uh, relatively uh, ocean, relatively frozen with just intermittent uh, open pools and leads in the ice where you would look for eiders and other birds. Unfortunately, in recent years with global warming, we're seeing less and less pack ice. And we were going, uh, our barrow trips used to run in late June, and we were getting uh, up there a couple years in a row where there was no ice at all, which was really sad to see. Uh, our barrow trip runs earlier now, so you should see uh, plenty of pack ice when you're there. And you are looking for eiders. All four species of eiders, uh, king, stellars, and spectacle breed in barrow, and commons migrate. So you, you hope to see all four species on a trip. If you're there early in the season, you may see them out on the ice, like this male king eider resting out on the ice. This one, another male king eider, has come into a lagoon uh, right at the base of, of one of the roads that you drive out.
And then here are two males out on the tundra. Once they are ready to breathe, they go out onto the, the open, once the tundra pools open up and thaw out, the eiders leave the pack ice and go out into the tundra pools and that's where you find them. This is at the end of the Gaswell Road, two male king eiders resting on the edge of a pond. Here is a Stellar's eider, the smallest of the eiders, in some ways the most interesting, the one is the most distinct from the other eiders. And perhaps the most wanted bird of any trip, two barrow, the spectacle eider male, named for its big white goggled appearance. See on the next slide as well, but notice how far these black underparts, how far up the neck the black goes. Switching to the next slide here, you can see black goes way up high. So if you had a flock of eiders migrating overhead at a distance and you couldn't really make out the head pattern all that well, if you could see how far that black went up, it's the only eider where the black goes that far up the chest and you could identify the bird at some distance in flight. The other star of Barrow are the snowy owls. And much like I mentioned with the short-eared owls earlier, their numbers fluctuate a lot. When there are a lot of lemmings on the tundra around Barrow, there are lots of snowy owls. When there aren't many lemmings, there are very few snowy owls. Uh, I have done quite a few trips to Barrow and have never completely missed snowy owl, but I've had trips where we saw a couple dozen and I've had trips where we saw one or two. This nearly pure white individual is probably an older adult male. The, uh, the older males get whiter and whiter. Females and young birds have more black markings on them. This is a female taken uh, right in town, sitting on a fence line, a snow break fence. Um, they can get blacker than this. Some of the young, young birds are just extensively marked with black. Snowy owls weigh up to four, four pounds, I think, on average. Uh, by a comparison, great horned owl weighs about three pounds and great gray owl about two and a half. These are huge, massive owls. And I read one study that said that uh, in a year, a snowy owl can eat an average of 1,600 lemmings in one year. A lot of other birds around Barrow on the tundra, uh, Jaegers, all three species possible. This is a dark moor parasitic Jaeger. This is a Pomeranian Jaeger. Their numbers also fluctuate somewhat around lemming populations. This is the largest of the Jaegers. And there are shorebirds everywhere. Back to our friend, the American golden plover that we saw back in Nome. Pectoral sandpipers, one of the common breeding birds of, of Barrow, looking very different from what they do in migration as we as most of us see them in the lower 48. It's not completely visible in this slide, but this whole area of the breast and upper back becomes a giant ruff, almost like a mane, and can be almost completely blackish. And the pectoral sandpipers, males will fly low over the tundra, making these bizarre hooting sounds to attract females and to proclaim their territory. Red phalaropes are common in Barrow. Uh, this is a female. In phalaropes, the females are the more brightly colored of the two. The males do all the uh, parental duties of uh, incubating the eggs and raising the youngs, while the females just sit out and look pretty. Red phalarope, female, certainly one of the most beautiful shorebirds, I think, in the world in breeding plumage. Again, if you saw them in migration along either coast, maybe on a pelagic trip, they would be gray on the back and white below. Hence the European name of gray phalarope. This is what they look like if you can get to the far north where they breed. Pacific loons are common breeders around Barrow. And we talked about the Arctic loon when we saw it earlier and how it had this white patch along the side. In this area, notice on the Pacific loon how this is black all the way along the waterline. The back of the head is a real pale silvery gray, not a dark gray. And this part of the head is more rounded, and the bill is held horizontal. Arctic loon had an upward pointed bill, darker gray head, and a white flank patch. Long tailed ducks, common all around Barrow. 
uncommon species, but one that you expect to see on pretty much every trip to Barrow is one of the most beautiful gulls in the world, in my opinion, the Sabin's gull. When they fly, they have a spectacular three-toned wing pattern. But even when sitting like this, they have a beautiful sooty gray head with a black border, a little red eye ring, which is kind of hard to see, and a bill dipped in yellow. Not many passerine birds in Barrow, a few things around. The most common one I actually don't have a photo of in this presentation, snow buntings are everywhere in Barrow. They sit on the rooftops of every home. They are walking around in the streets. This is a Lapland longspur. We saw that in, on our gnome uh, portion. This is a female out on the open tundra. And there are plenty of red poles around Barrow. You get common red poles, you get hoary red poles, and you get hybrid red poles. A lot of confusion about red pole taxonomy right now, and they may ultimately all be lumped together. This is a pretty decent looking hoary type red pole, real pale whitish on the chest with a blush of pink, not much in the way of streaking. You can't really see it, but this bird had a nice bright white rump unstreaked. Uh, but you do get a lot of intergrades there. A lot of uh, the streaking along the flanks is a little bit atypical for a full hoary maybe. But uh, Red poles, one of the common passerine birds. So that completed uh, Grand Alaska 1, the gnome and barrow portions. And now we go to Grand Alaska 2, which is Anchorage, Denali, and the Kenai Peninsula. Anchorage has some amazing birding right in town. People often arrive early to an Anchorage trip. Uh, and they poke around town a little bit and see quite a few birds. We also do birding on our uh, a couple of our trips right in and around Anchorage. And there are several city lakes and marshes that have been set aside that offer some great birding. Arctic terns, again, very common all over Anchorage. I like this photo because it shows just how short leg Arctic tern is. See, they, they look like they're standing in a hole. They have tiny little legs compared to other similar terns bright red bill, red all the way to the tip, real dusky gray below. Redneck greaves breed all over the city of Anchorage. Beautiful breeding plumage with her bright red neck and yellow bill. Bald eagles, widespread throughout not only Anchorage, but basically the southern half of Alaska. Uh, some areas that you visit, you may see 20, 30 bald eagles in a day. This one was taking a bath at a place called Potter Marsh, just south of Anchorage, while we watched. Trumpeter swans can be found in Alaska from Denali south all the way down to the uh, Kenai Peninsula, but they're breeding right around Anchorage now. This beautiful pair with uh, four little babies here in the middle. The uh, trumpeter swans is, is farther north in Nome, tundra swan is the common one. Uh, trumpeter swans in the south, and you can see here on the bill, a tundra swan would have a yellow spot in this area, whereas trumpeter swan has a thin orange line where the mandibles meet, lacks the yellow spot, and the black of the bill on a tundra swan would kind of come to a point, and the eye would really stand out uh, by itself in the head, whereas on a, a trumpeter here, the black of the bill sort of engulfs the eye. American three-toed woodpeckers, uh, uncommon bird pretty much everywhere that they occur, but they, they do nest right within the city limits of Anchorage. And we uh, have had great success in tracking them down. In recent years, there've been a lot of fires, particularly north of Anchorage. And three-toed woodpeckers and black-backed woodpeckers both like recently burned areas. So uh, we've been seeing them with greater regularity recently. This particular individual was seen on the very first morning of an uh, Alaska tour before we headed to Nome. We had a 9 a.m. flight to Nome and we weren't going to do anything except go to the airport and we knew where a nest was and we blasted over there and saw it as one of our very first birds of the tour. Anchorage is not really an area where you think of seeing Asiatic strays, but they do occur there, even though it's far south and far inland. And in 2019, an example of this was this fabulous male falcated duck that spent several weeks at Potter Marsh, just south of town, and was seen uh, by a couple of our bent tours. 
a lot of moose in and around Anchorage. I read uh, one estimate that within the municipality, they're estimated to be 2,000 moose in Anchorage. You could be in downtown Anchorage and see a moose strolling along the city streets on occasion. They are certainly uh, numerous. This little baby was photographed on the boardwalk at Potter Marsh on a recent trip. Black bears. Bears are prevalent in and around Anchorage. Um, I think population estimates of black bears within the city of Anchorage, around 250 black bears and between 30 and 40 grizzly bears. So again, you could be right in town or on the outskirts of town and see a bear. This one was south of town by about 20 miles at a, a little town called Girdwood. Seen on a tour about four years ago up in a poplar tree. And I'm not sure what he was specifically there to eat, but he was basically eating the entire tree. It had seeds on it he was eating. He was eating the leaves and he was eating the bark and just dismantling this tree as we watched. We watched him for over half an hour. We came back two, two days later and looked in that same tree and the tree was basically gone. He had just destroyed the tree. Here's the same bear getting ready to break a branch above his head. Looks like he's waving at us. And south of Anchorage, a little ways along Turnigan Arm are some big rocky cliffs where you frequently see dull sheep. After you birded Anchorage for a day or two, you head northwards towards Denali National Park. And this is an area of just unbelievable scenery. There are lots of birds as well, and we bird in route to the park. The park lies about 250 miles north of Anchorage, and in one of the recent burn areas called the Sockeye Burn, we, uh, we've been seeing a lot of woodpeckers. Uh, Three-toed woodpecker we saw earlier, and this is a black-backed woodpecker, which is not a bird we used to see on our tours with any regularity, but uh, in recent years, due to the burn, they've really increased, and we've, we've been seeing them. Depending on if there are any good owls present, we sometimes make a diversion on this tour away from the straight direct route to the park along the Parks Highway, and we go out the Glen Allen Highway. And here again, just some astonishing scenery, but the, the main reason to make this diversion would be if there were any reliable northern hawk owls present. This area has proven in past years to be particularly good for hawk owl, which is one of our big targets on this leg of the trip. Unfortunately, not seen in the last two, three or four years, maybe, but for a number of years out the same stretch of highway, there was a reliable pair of great gray owls, which uh, were just amazing. This particular year, maybe 2015 or so, uh, a pair with, with some fledged young, and you could just walk up to within 40 or 50 feet of them. Just astonishing views of what I think is one of the most amazing birds in the world. Spruce grouse is always on your mind anywhere in the Anchorage, Denali, Seward area. Fairly common bird, but not commonly seen. You have to get lucky. We probably see them on a little bit more than 50% of our tours. This is a female that we found along the highway driving north to Denali. And she has some chicks nearby her, which kind of scattered up into the low trees and brush while we were looking. As we continue northward towards our hotel, about 130, 140 miles north of Anchorage, we stop at a restaurant for lunch. And the restaurant is appropriately named Denali View. And it has a deck out back and you're looking at Mount McKinley or Denali is where the cursor is here, kind of almost looks like it's clouds, but that is Mount McKinley there. Highest peak in North America, 20,320 feet name changed back to Denali, an Athabascan word, which means the tall one or the high one or the great one, depending on where you read. But awfully nice to be able to sit there and have lunch if you have a clear day and be able to see Denali. Now, many days are cloudy and you can't see it from this view. Our hotel lies just uh, south of the park itself, a little bit away from the hustle and bustle of some of the other uh, big hotel complexes. And there are birds on the hotel grounds. And a couple of years ago, walking to dinner, uh, we 
just right along the edge of the path encountered this juvenile white wing crossbill. This photo is taken just holding the phone up to the bird. No magnification, no digiscope, no shot through binoculars, nothing. This is a phone six inches from a bird that didn't care that we were looking at it. It's a juvenile because it's streaky. Females are yellowish, the males are pinkish. And then we spend one full day in Denali National Park itself. The park comprises about over 6 million acres. They have a tightly controlled system of access into the park. So basically we are on a, sh a shuttle bus system. It's about an eight to nine hour uh, ride into the park to the Isleson Visitor Center and back making stops along the way. And this day is primarily for scenery and mammal watching. Don't do a lot of bird watching on this, this one day into the park but there are lots of mammals. And you start out in the early portions of the ride, uh, you're more in trees and willows still, you see moose. And then as you break out, you gain elevation as you go along the route and you break out into the higher tundra areas and you're likely to encounter caribou, including this uh, male right along the road, walking right past our bus. And the star of any trip into the national park is are the grizzly bears. Uh, sometimes you see eight or ten. Sometimes you see one or two. You just never know. I think in I believe I've done 28 uh, full-length Alaska tours that visited Denali, and only once did we not see a bear on the you know, on the ride into the park. The bears here in the park are very omnivorous. They eat a lot of roots and berries and ground squirrels and things like that. Consequently, they don't get nearly as large as the ones that you see down along the south coastal areas, the brown bears, which uh, have a high fat diet of salmon and get to be double the size. Now, you cannot promise this on any visit to Denali National Park. In fact, in the month of June is a month of a lot of cloudiness and rain. Uh, only 10% of the days look like this on average. But this was on our tour in I think 2018, I believe, and we had the mountain in basically full view, a few little uh, wispy clouds here in the foreground, but there you are looking at Denali or Mount McKinley. Uh, and I think at this point you are maybe 70 miles away and look how massive it is. This is um, a turn on the road that provides a particularly good viewpoint when you're just a few miles from your end destination at the Isleson Visitor Center. One of the birds you might see on your drive into the park along the road as you cruise along are the willow ptarmigan again that we saw back in Nome, but notice that this particular individual is much further along into breeding plumage. The one we saw in Nome had a red head, but its body was almost entirely white. This bird now has got the, the gold, black, and buff feathering on the back and the rump, and is basically in full breeding plumage. The best birding, however, when you're in the Denali region is out a road, a dirt road called the Denali Highway that runs about 140 miles east-west south of the park. And so that's where we do most of our birding up in that area. Canada Jay, formerly known as Gray Jay, is one of the birds we typically see. And the road is sort of a, uh, stunted spruce forest taiga area. And one of our targets out there is Bohemian Waxwing. Notice the bright chestnut undertail cover. It's one of the identifying field marks. Black pole warbler is another species that is a common breeder in this area. And we talked about the amazing migration of bar-tail godwits. Well, the black pole warbler is no slouch either. Nesting in the far, far north here, um, where our, my cursor is, is more or less where Denali National Park would be. And the fall, when they're done breeding, these birds migrate southeasterly down to the coast, uh, into this area, sort of off the, in the Carolinas. Uh, recent studies show that this migration from, from Nome, actually, they were looking at birds, down to the Carolinas took about 18 days. So that now, in and of itself is big, healthy migration, but it's over land, so the bird could stop. When they get down here, they fatten up, uh, double their body weight in some cases, 
and then they have to take off. This is a tiny little land bird. Uh, the godwit at least had size going for it, but the black pole warbler launches out after it's uh, built up its fat reserves and has to make a nonstop flight to northern South America down here into Colombia. And that flight may take three days of nonstop uh, flying. So just another absolutely amazing migration of a, of a bird species. Along the Denali Highway uh, is another area where you might encounter the Arctic warblers that we saw in Nome earlier. And in some of the intermittent pools, you will see shorebirds. And you'll see shorebirds in trees, which is not where you would typically expect to see them uh, in the lower 48. This one is on an old uh, spruce stump. It's a solitary sandpiper. But you might see yellow legs, both species of yellow legs, snipe, solitary sandpiper sitting up in treetops and uh, calling, defending their territory. Not, not at all unusual to see a shorebird in a tree. And this is the other road where you hope to see a northern hawk owl. If you don't see one on the Glen Allen Highway, then you hope to get one on the Denali Highway, where we spend a lot of time looking for. And we're gonna bring our webinar presentation to a conclusion here with the last portion of the Grand Alaska Two tour, which is Seward and the Kenai Peninsula, uh, which flies about 100 miles south of Anchorage. This is the slide that we showed at the opening of the webinar. Uh, this is Upper Trail Lake as you're heading south from Anchorage going towards Seward and just absolutely stunning scenery. We were lucky on this day to have a near perfect mirror reflection in the lake and literally just jaw dropping uh, views here. A lot of birds in route that we take a day to go from Anchorage to Seward and a day to go back and we bird all along the way. Golden Crown Sparrows in full breeding plumage and full song are common. The closer you get to Seward, the more you, uh, the birch trees give way, the deciduous trees give way to coniferous trees and you get into some tall spruce trees. And in those areas, the bird life really changes. Buried thrushes a breed commonly not only a beautiful bird, but a bird with a haunting, spectacular song. Townsend's warbler, common breeding warbler in the tall spruce forest uh, of the Kenai Peninsula. Golden crown kinglets, familiar to a lot of people throughout the United States, and they breed uh, all the way up into Alaska. This is a male with his uh, orange center crown erected in angry fashion. Dippers breed uh, throughout Alaska, really, but there's one spot in particular in particular that we go to a uh, uh, salmon weir just north of Seward, where we look for uh, dippers. A pair breeds there every year, and these were two uh, youngsters that had fledged out of the nest and were just kind of sitting around waiting for mom and dad to come and feed them. Pine grosbeaks, common uh, in the Kenai Peninsula. It's a beautiful male. The subspecies that occurs in Alaska is, is more extensively red than in a lot of areas they occur. There's a female with its kind of coppery yellow uh, crown and rump. Pine grosbeak is a special bird for me and my brother. It was the bird that in 1971 got us started in birding. If it weren't for pine grosbeaks, I wouldn't be here giving this webinar right now. Amazingly, the tiny little rufous hummingbird travels all the way up to Alaska, the northernmost of all the hummingbird species, nest in south coastal Alaska. We go to some homes uh, where they have feeders and get to see the rufous hummingbird, which winters all the way down in central Mexico. Quite another great migratory feat. Pacific wrens are uncommon, but we uh, always try to see a Pacific wren somewhere in the Seward area incredible uh, song that this bird has. It doesn't seem to stop. Tiny bird with a loud belting out song. And this is one of the roads we bird around Seward, Nash, Nash Road, just more scenery. I can't, I can't stress enough how the scenery in Alaska will blow you away. We've had uh, non-birding spouses come on some of our Alaska tours and the mammals and scenery alone is is worth the trip for them even when they're not into birds. 
We stay in the north side of Seward and right across from our hotel is a little pond where common mergansers frequently breed. There's a female with multiple chicks that she's protecting under her left side there. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention food on this particular uh, tour, Grand Alaska too. The food in Anchorage and in Seward is some of the best, arguably the best food that I encounter on any tour I do in the world. Incredible fresh seafood, salmon dinner here. Of course, king crab, which Alaska is famous for, but we visit some uh, really amazingly good restaurants uh, on Grand Alaska too in particular. This view is taken from our hotel. This is the Seward Boat Harbor. The hotel sits right on the edge of the water. You can look out your hotel window if you've got a room facing the harbor and see sea otters and birds, things right from your hotel room. Whoops, sorry, skipped by a slide there. Um, our full day in Seward is spent on a boat trip going out into Kenai Fjords National Park, about a nine hour boat trip. And it's amazing boat trip, not just for the birds, but for the scenery and the mammals. This is one of our groups from uh, maybe three or four years ago, because we're getting ready to depart Seward and head out for our boat ride. Rafael Galvez, my co-leader here on the far left. Scenery right away is uh, just all day long, beautiful scenery. This is protected fjordland waters. Uh, you'll notice relatively calm water here, and you'll see that in most all the pictures. <clears throat> Roughly eight or seven of the nine hours of the trip are within uh, protected coastal waters that are not typically uh, rough at all. And we do have an hour and a half to two hours of the boat trip where we venture out a little bit more into the edge of the Gulf of Alaska where you have some potential for rough water. But in general, this is a relatively calm boat trip. more scenery along the way. One of the first things you usually encounter on a boat trip into Kenai Fjords National Park are sea otters. They're pretty common. This particular individual is actually photographed from right outside the restaurant in Seward, but uh, we see a lot of them on the boat trip, often see dozens of them, and typically pull up uh, right next to one and, and get to watch these entertaining critters from up close. One of the other mammals that we uh, typically see on our boat trips are dolls porpoises. They look like little mini orcas. They love to play with the boat. They will come from some distance away and come shooting over and get right in front of the boat and ride uh, next to the bow. And you can look right down and see them as they leap out of the water. It's supposed to be the fastest marine mammal in the world. It's uh, getting its speeds up to 35 miles an hour. Really a joy to see. I apologize in advance for the quality of bird photos from the boat. Uh, all of my photography is done by digiscoping, and scoping a bird from a moving boat is next to impossible. So I don't have a lot in the way of uh, birds to show you from the boat trip, but I can tell you that they're plentiful. We visit the Chiswell Islands, which is part of the Alaska Maritime uh, National Wildlife Refuge, and uh, they're nesting seabirds everywhere. One island that we visit, uh, the beehive, number one, I think, is estimated to have 4,000 nesting pairs of horned and 4,000 nesting pairs of tufted puffins. There are murres, uh, kittiwakes, cormorants, it's tons of birds. But anyway, I do have a few bird slides that I managed to uh, photograph through my binoculars. This is horned puffin, one of the more common breeding birds. We also see uh, whales on our, tr our our boat trip, and humpback is the most regular. We've never never missed humpback whale on the trip. We often see uh, 10 to 20 humpbacks in many, many real close encounters with them. Humpbacks, I think, is, of course, most people know, have a distinctive uh, under tail, under fluke pattern here. So every humpback, it's different. It's like a fingerprint, and they catalog thousands of humpbacks around the world, and they can compare photos like this one, look in a catalog and look for distinctive marks such as this long black horizontal stripe on the left fluke here, and they can actually identify individual whales and track them by these means. 
some of the cliffs have big numbers of common MERS. We see thousands of common MERS within the day. Uh, another bird we look for here that is common on the Pribloffs, but scarce uh, down in South Coast Alaska is thick-billed MER. And we usually can, by thorough searching, spot three or four thick-billed MERS. Tufted puffins, always a big crowd favorite. Again, thousands of these nesting on the Chiswell Islands where we go. Much less numerous, but we, we do see rhinoceros auklets, uh, small numbers of those, not so much on the cliffs, but out in the open ocean. They're named for, it's hard to see, it's not a very good photo, a little uh, protuberance at the base of the bill that sticks up like a horn in the breeding season, giving them the name rhinoceros auklet. Pigeon guillemots are common, particularly near shore uh, in the more protected areas of water. They're bright red feet. These two are sitting out on a rock. And we see stellar sea lions, a mammal that uh, occurs way south, uh, even as far south as, as uh, California, parts of California, I believe. But the numbers in Alaska dropped uh, precipitously starting in the 1970s over about a 30 plus year stretch, I think over 60% of the population was uh, disappeared. And there were a couple theories about this. One, that the warming of the ocean waters had changed the composition of the fish life and there wasn't the, the, the proper fish there to maintain that for them to survive. And then also the overfishing, the commercial industry overfishing the waters surrounding this area. In recent years, apparently they've stabilized and are actually beginning a slow comeback but we do visit, uh, get up next to some rocks with some colonies of stellar sea lions. This is a big bull here with his harem uh, all around him on the rock. We don't get far enough out in the ocean since we stay near shore to see uh, things like shearwaters and storm petrels and albatrosses, things like that. But we do have a short stretch of about an hour where we dip our toe into the Gulf of Alaska and we might see some of those birds. And one of the more regular, regular species we would be likely to encounter would be short-tailed shearwater. Another highlight of this day is the chance to see killer whale or orca. Probably about 50% of our, our boat trips, we do get to see killer whales. This particular one um, was a pod, I think maybe two years ago, that was within 40 feet of our boat, maybe eight to 10 animals, and they were feeding and pretty much oblivious to us and the best views I've ever had of, of orca. The boat trip kind of concludes with a visit. Uh, you get about 75 miles out from Seward and you reach what, uh, you go in Northwestern Fjord and at the uh, end of the fjord is Northwestern Glacier. This is a calving tidewater glacier and we go up and we sit there and we uh, hope to see chunks of ice calving off into the water, which is an amazing sight and sound both. I will say that like most glaciers in Alaska, Northwestern Glacier is receding. I started going there in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, this entire area was a wall of ice all the way across. All this exposed rock that you see was, was covered glacier. And now it's really only this portion right here in the center, and a little bit tucked in here on the center right where it actually uh, is truly tidewater reaching the, reaching the water. So it's been very sad to see the decline in the glacier. But we do pull up quite close. It gives you a little better perspective. That previous photo was probably taken from over a mile away from the glacier. And now we've at least halved the distance and you can see the height of the glacier wall here. And we sit here for, again, about a half an hour and just listen, quietly listen to the sounds of the glacier moving. It sounds like rifle shots when a big piece of ice uh, a big chunk calves off and hits the water, certainly something you will never forget. And the last bird I want to mention, uh, the most wanted bird of this particular boat trip, a bird that's confined uh, to this area of Alaska pretty much, um, is the Kitlitz's merlin. And it is a glacier specialist. Uh, it nests on scree slopes on the sides of glaciers, pretty much inaccessible areas to get to and then feeds in the water uh, right below glaciers. So you really have to be close to the glacier to find one. Uh, it's much more common cousin. The marbled merlet is a bird that we see a lot of on our boat trip typically, but
that the Kitlitzes is pretty much only around uh, one of the two glaciers that we go to. And we really have to search, search uh, hard to find them and our boat captains have been very cooperative with us in the past in locating, making sure we get good views. Only remember once, again, in almost 30 trips that I've done to Alaska where we missed Kitlitzes. Compared to marbled Merlot, uh, the upper parts here are much more spangled golden, a lot paler. Hard to see, but on the sides of the tail, they uh, have white outer tail feathers, which marbled does not have. And then you can see on this right-hand bird, a white, white belly when they bank. You can see it just here in front of the wing and just there behind. This shot was taken by my co-leader, Eric Brunke, just a fantastic uh, flight shot of Kitlis's Merlot. Really appreciate him letting me use it. And I'm gonna conclude here uh, with this final slide. Uh, this was on uh, our 2018 or 2019, I can't recall. We were heading back in, end of a long day, long successful day, heading back into Seward. And the boat captain came over the intercom and said, I've got a report of some humpbacks feeding, uh, lunge feeding, bubble net feeding. Uh, nearby, we're gonna take a little detour. And so we'd already seen humpbacks very well for the day, but this was an opportunity to see a feeding behavior that is seldom seen by anyone. And this bubble net feeding occurs when there's a group of, of whales and one or two of them uh, swim under the surface and blow air out in, the, in a circular pattern. It creates a wall of bubbles surrounding a school, a large school of fish. And then the fish feel trapped by these bubbles, so they congregate in the middle. And then all the whales dive down below the bubble net and then come up through the middle with jaws open. And I think you can see here, particularly on this individual, mouth completely open. The kittiwakes are flying all around, hoping to get some of the, the fish that are brought to the surface as well. I think there were six or seven humpbacks. We watched them feed for 15 to 20 minutes in this manner. Uh, once in a lifetime experience, the boat captain who does this every day and had been working there, I think for 10 or 11 years, said he had never seen this particular uh, bubble net feeding like this. So it was just uh, shows what incredible things you might encounter. You never know on any given day in Alaska what you might see. We do have some suggested reading as well. Um, if you're going to go on our Alaska tours, you uh, might want to look into some of these books. A book specifically on the, on the far left on the occurrence of birds that range in Alaska. The next, next one, a, uh, a book of Asian birds. If you want to study up on possible Asiatic vagrants that you might encounter, then Birding in the American West, an all-around great book for any bird tour that you might do uh, anywhere in the Western United States, but certainly has applications to Alaska as well. And then the last one, a relatively new book, an Arctic guide that is circumpolar. It's not just Alaska, but covers um, you know, around the world, but covers everything from birds to mammals to butterflies to plants to fish, and is uh, really highly recommended. I've only uh, done 60% of our program because I really couldn't uh, delve too much into the, uh, the gamble and crib loss portion, but I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, Barry, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Beautiful photos. Thank you, Ben. And so just, uh, just to recap a little bit about the Grand Alaska program, uh, <clears throat> the four vent leaders that comprise the program here wanted to show their lovely photos uh, for the group and to outline the Grand Alaska tour dates uh, for 2021. 
Here are the five uh, in that program. And you notice that part one, we have three spaces available and part two, there's one space available. And then for 2022, uh, we have a similar program. The prices uh, will be announced. If you have further questions, contact eric at ventbird.com. His contact is below. And also this slide is in the handouts. Now for the 2021 Grand Alaska Tours, uh, we do have some, some discounts uh, that are going on. And I'll briefly show those to everyone. Uh, if you register by February 1st, there are an assortment of discounts on select tours. And again, this is a slide that you can download as a handout. If you have questions about this after the webinar, feel free to contact Eric at ventbird.com or myself. And now we would like to open it up with questions. And so we will we will begin with um, the the sunlight, the 24 hours of sun. How does that affect uh, bird sleeping patterns? Well, it depends on the bird, really. Um, the water birds tend to be active just throughout the day. Uh, they'll they could be active at two, three in the morning, and they just have periods where they, they sleep and rest during the day. Land birds are another matter. They seem to follow um, a pattern that would be typical of a place that had you know eight or 10 hours of darkness. They really shut down nine, 10 o'clock in the evening and, uh, and start back up again about 5.30 or six in the morning. Despite the fact that it's light outside, they just, they have an internal clock that they know that that's the time to go to sleep. So if you're out birding late in one of these areas like Barrow or Nome that has uh, either 24 hour sunlight or something close to it, you will see a lot of shorebirds and water birds if you're out birding late, but you won't see that many land birds. They seem to know uh, that it, that is their time to go to sleep regardless of the fact that the sun is still up. Here's a question from Alan, and I think that this is probably applicable to everyone, uh, and, and the answer is quite uncertain, but how likely do you think uh, the 2021 trips uh, will be happening? Wow, I'm not sure uh, if that's something I can accurately answer or not. A lot of the projections of when a, uh, a vaccine would be widely available uh, have been April, May, June. Uh, if we're on the early end of that, if, if vaccine is available in, in April and May, then I think there's a good chance that the uh, 2021 Alaska program may be the some of our first uh, tours to go again. But that's really not, not my area of expertise to know uh, when that vaccine will be out there, but we are very hopeful that uh, Alaska could uh, be kicking off sort of the uh, the beginning event uh, running tours again. It could be right about the, the appropriate time. Uh, Charlene asked, do you see belugas at Turnigan Arm often? Sometimes, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, there's a specific area we drive right by called uh, Beluga Point or Beluga Lookout uh, on Turnigan Arm. And uh, we have seen them from there. We've also seen them uh, in Anchorage at a place that uh, we go to called Westchester Lagoon, where you can get out along the, the uh, Tony Knowles coastal, coastal Trail and look out into the water. And you sometimes see them from there. If I had to put up a percentage of how often we see belugas on uh, our Grand Alaska 2 tour, I would say 20% maybe. Um, I'd like to take this moment to announce our upcoming webinar, a celebration of neotropical birds, an invitation to Trinidad's world-famous Asa Wright Nature Center and beyond with Rafael Galvez. Most birders who have visited Trinidad agree that it is perhaps the single best place to gain an introduction to South American birds. Lying barely 12 miles off the coast of Venezuela, 
Trinidad's bird life is much like that of Northern South America, but without the daunting variety. From the comforts of the Lange's veranda, one can see dozens of species, including tanagers, honey creepers, and ant shrikes, while sipping the regional coffee or savoring the traditional rum punch. The ease of access to mannequin leks and oil bird caves makes Trinidad a top choice for birders wishing to savor the delights of neotropical birding. Join Rafael Galvez, vent tour leader and artist extraordinaire, for this educational webinar about the life histories of typical bird species found at Trinidad's Asa Wright Nature Center, world famous for its stunning variety of birds, and learn how this knowledge extends to other New World birding destination and vents tour offerings. Um, here's a question um, from Alan. If, uh, if we arrive in Anchorage early, where do you recommend uh, looking for birds within walking distance? Well, within walking distance, our hotel is uh, obviously close to the airport, but it's also close to uh, what is the busiest float plane lake in, um, I think in the world actually. And that's maybe a quarter mile away from our hotel and there are some walking trails that go around it. And the, uh, the lake there has a variety of water birds, uh, depending on how much airplane traffic is on it at any given uh, time. But it can have uh, diving ducks, can have golden eyes, can have foul ropes, uh, sometimes loons. So that's a good easy place, literally five minute walk from our hotel. There's also a, a little trail out behind our hotel that goes out through a uh, kind of a marshy, slightly wooded area. There's a little bit of a boardwalk back there. And so you have some breeding birds like alder flycatcher, Lincoln sparrow, uh, things like that. And occasionally right around the hotel, there are uh, planting uh, spruce trees. And the last two years, I think we've had white wing crossbills right around the hotel. So all that's kind of within, within uh, walking distance and then short taxi rides to a place like Westchester Lagoon maybe five minutes away or Potter Marsh 15 minutes away uh, places we would bird as a group on the tour but if you got there early and you wanted to uh, take a short ride out good birding areas uh, that would just be a, a, a real short taxi ride away. Great. Uh, Sarah has a comment she says thanks for a great talk and the fabulous pictures of Alaska Hope to get back in 2021. Wow, tell Sarah I said thank you and I hope to see her back in 2021 again. Uh, Stan and Lori ask, is the Siberian ruby throat possible on the gnome trip? It is a rarity. Uh, there was one about uh, a handful of years ago, four or five years ago, a male that showed up and was uh, set up territory and was seen for about a week out there. But it would be, it would be unexpected but it'd be one of those uh, Asiatic vagrants that would be possible, uh, more likely to turn up uh, in a place like the Pribloffs, but it would be, uh, you know, it'd be a, a real find and known, but not out of the realm of possibility. Ted asks, do you ever see the stellar sea eagle? <laughs> I wish, uh, I've only seen that in the Kamchatka Peninsula of uh, Siberia, but this year, when of course there were no tours up there, there was one found out along the Denali Highway, a place that I talked about in the uh, in the webinar where we go specifically to look for hawk owl and bohemian waxwing and uh, uh, species like that. And there was one found by a birder out there. It was incredible. I mean, the Denali Highway is in the middle of the state and you know, way away from the coastal areas. And it was photographed extensively and it was seen uh, at least two or three times over a, a several week period. Um, but it, it would be a one in a million shot to get a stellar sea eagle on, on any of our Alaska tours, pretty much. Uh, Sandra asks, in general, how are the eider duck populations doing? Well, the uh, spectacled eider and stellar's eiders both have undergone some declines in particular. And uh, there was one study, uh, this, the spectacled eiders along the well, west coast of Alaska, uh, that they had declined something like 60 or 70 percent over a period of like 30 years. It was a precipitous decline, and the researchers were very concerned about that. 
and they still the numbers along the west side of Alaska are down. But on the north slope of Alaska by Barrow, where we uh, look for them on our Barrow tour, I think the numbers have been pretty steady. Uh, there are more of, of the eiders over in Russia than there are actually in Alaska. And I don't know about their numbers there. The uh, spectacled eiders had a completely unknown wintering area for many, many years. And I mean, nobody had any idea where they were and they discovered them uh, out in, I think they were flying in a helicopter over the frozen part of the Bering Sea. And they saw this big brown patch out in the snow and it was, it was spectacled eiders that were all together in a massive flock, keeping the water open by their body heat. And I forget, it was like 200,000 birds or something. It was basically all of the spectacled eiders in the world were in one spot wintering in the middle of the Bering Sea. But anyway, I mean, long story short, they, their numbers are declining, at least of spectacled and stellars. But I think that precipitous decline has uh, staved off somewhat in the spectacled eiders. Ari asks if, if, uh, if we have species lists, uh, a bird list for each of these trips. Yes, I would assume that's available on the event website. Uh, you know, all of our tours, we do bird list, uh, which not just bird list, but includes mammals and butterflies and everything else. And uh, lists from all the past tours should be available if you go on to the event website, uh, eventbird.com, and uh, just look, uh, click on the tour, and then you should be able to uh, find where the itinerary is and then previous uh, bird list as well as photo galleries where you can see pictures taken on uh, on the tours uh, for different years and all that. So that information should all be on our website. And Ari, if you have questions about that, uh, reach out to me an email and I can help you find those specific uh, lists. And it looks like, Barry, we have uh, two more questions. Okay. Uh, our one is a comment uh, from Catherine, it says, don't forget about the bakery on the way to Seward. <laughs> well, that must be Kathy from Houston, uh, who was with me with the black bear uh, incident that we talked about earlier with the bear eating the tree. And we do stop at uh, the fabulous Alpine Bakery uh, en route uh, from Anchorage to Seward, one of the best bakeries anywhere and uh, certainly a highlight of that, of that travel day at the Alpine Bakery. Here's our final question for the day, Barry. Is the gray-headed chickadee possible on the Nome or Barrow trips? No, no, that is a bird uh, that's basically in inaccessible areas. You have to uh, fly into like a with a, a bush plane, you know, go out uh, into the interior Yukon Delta River areas and camp out. Uh, it, it's a hard bird to find. There are trips that have been uh, conducted bird tours to see them, but they're uh, camping trips uh, out in the interior of Alaska. They don't make it. Uh, quite make it into the Nome area, and they're not uh, as far north as Barrow. So that is actually one of the very few nesting birds of North America that I have never seen. So not not a bird you will see on our tours. Well, I want to thank you, Barry, for the wonderful presentation, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending today's webinar, and hope everybody has a great day. We'll see you next time. Thank you.